Well, good morning and gra- glad to be with you here today. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for your Easter morning. When I ask as I begin, if I give you enough time, I'm sure we could all think of examples in our lives. Um, but there are times in our lives where we feel empty, right? Where things aren't going our way, where we're not sure if things are going to get better. Uh, as a sports fan, if you're a sports fan, you know that happens all the time. And you guys that know me know I'm a big Duke fan. And so sometimes, for example, when Duke is losing to Carolina, and uh, this is the last weekend of college basketball, so I won't be able to reference it for a while, so I'm going to go in this last weekend here. Um, when Duke loses to Carolina, I start to feel empty, like, oh, my friends are going to start texting me, calls, all this thing's going to happen. And uh, there was one time about five or six years ago where this was the case. Duke was losing. They were not the better team that year. Uh, they were losing the entire game, and then this happened. I don't know if this uh, picture brings back memories for anybody. Um, that is Austin Rivers hitting a game-winning three-pointer over Carolina at the buzzer, and they had lost the entire game. And so that was a time in my life where I felt empty, and then things turned out great, and I wasn't empty anymore. Um, I'll give you an example from my wife, Christina, if you guys know us, if you know my story. Uh, she dumped me twice, um, but both times she dumped me, she was like, oh, no, my life's empty. This is terrible. What have I did, done? And so immediately she you know, comes crawling back and like begs for me to take her back. She says it doesn't happen that way, but I have the microphone, so I get to say uh, my version of it. Right, but that happens in our lives. Sometimes things are happening in our lives, and we're like, man, this really stinks. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the stories that I just shared had good endings, but the reality is there's a, a lot of times where uh, something happens, and it's not going to be fixed, or it doesn't look like it's going to be fixed. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe a relationship was ending. So the question is, what do we do in those times where everything seems like it's lost, where everything seems like it's empty? That's definitely how the disciples felt when Jesus was crucified uh, on this weekend uh, uh, that we're celebrating about 2,000 years ago. Uh, and so this morning, I just want to say thank you. If it's your first time, it's an honor that you chose to spend your Easter morning with us. And so what I want to do real quick is I just want to get us all up, up to speed on what's happening that led to the day that we celebrate uh, today, which is Easter. Uh, and so what you have is Jesus, who for three years had his earthly ministry, was going around, telling people about Je- about himself, performing all these miracles, uh, teaching about the kingdom of God. He's forgiving sins. He's healing people. He's claimed to have always existed. He's saying that him and God are one, which they would have taken in the first century as actually claiming to be God. Uh, He was claiming that all these Old Testament prophecies that were talking about a Messiah were actually talking about him. Uh, So he's talking about all these things, and a lot of people are really excited about it. Even if they don't fully understand everything that's happening, they're really excited about what's going on. Um, But at the same time, if you're familiar with the story, you know there's also a lot of people that aren't excited about it, particularly the religious leaders that Jesus called out a lot. Now, Jesus called them out not because they were religious leaders, and I don't know if you've ever wondered this. I wondered this for a long time. But I was like, man, why did all the religious leaders, like, why didn't they like Jesus? Because they've been yearning for this Messiah to come. Then you have a guy who seems like he's could be the Messiah. What was their problem? Uh, What we know historically, not to bore you with all the details this morning, but about 150 to 170 years before Jesus comes on the scene, the Jewish religious system with the high priests and how they kind of ran things began to be uh, highly corrupt. And so people started to buy and sell positions that they shouldn't have been able to buy and sell. And so when Jesus comes onto the scene, a lot of the religious leaders who were religious leaders and who had power should not have had power. And so Jesus was not just calling them out because of their uh, teachings and doing things inaccurately, but because they shouldn't even been in there in the first place. And so the religious leaders, like all of us, really value job security. So they start getting really mad and they want him killed so that they, everything can stay the way that it's going and so that they can stay in power. And so that's what's happening. And so finally, uh, the night that Jesus is betrayed, which would have been Friday for us, uh, he's with his disciples. And one of his disciples named Judas uh, betrays Jesus, hands him over to the guards. And they had to do this at night because it was Passover week in Jerusalem. So there was thousands and thousands of people. They couldn't arrest him during the day because it would cause a riot because a lot of people like Jesus and they would have been really mad about what's going on. And so Judas betrays Jesus and the religious leaders take them and they, and they take him and put him on trial in the middle of the night. And now I don't know about you, but you also may wonder why were there so many trials? Like, I don't understand what was going on. Uh, what was going on is that in this part of the world, like most of the world, uh, the J- Jerusalem and the J- uh, Judea region uh, was under Roman rule. And so Rome let Jerusalem and the religious leaders kind of do their own thing to a degree. But one thing they were not allowed to do was to put people to death. Only the Roman government could do that. And so the religious leaders arrest Jesus, of course, find him guilty. And so then they hand him over to this guy named Pilate, who you may be familiar with that name. Uh, Pilate was kind of the Roman governor of that province at that time. And they're telling him that Jesus needs to be put to death. We found him guilty. And if you're familiar with the story, you know Pilate's like, I don't 
think he's done anything that you have said he's done. Um, but because Pilate, like again, like the religious leaders like us, really values job security, he says, okay, go ahead and crucify him because he cannot have a riot on his hands. Because if a riot is on his hands, he's going to be taken out of his position. It seems like a lot of people want Jesus dead. So he's just like, all right, just do it. Just stop freaking out so everything can go back to normal. And so that's what happens. Jesus is horrifically tortured, crucified, and killed on a cross, and he dies. So that is what happens, and then uh, imagine with me for a moment, if you will, regardless of what you think about God or this whole Jesus thing, just imagine if you were the 12 disciples that had been following Jesus for the past three years, right? They had been with this man who was unlike anyone else and had done things that no one had ever done before, was really wise, smart, performing all these miracles, like surely like, there's something amazing about this person, and then all of a sudden, he's gone. Now, Jesus had been talking about this moment happening for a long time, but they didn't really understand uh, what was going on. And really, literally 24 hours before, everything was fine. And now Jesus is crucified on a cross. So the man that they had been following, who they had come to believe was actually the long-awaited Messiah, is now dead. The one that they had given up everything to follow and leave behind is now dead. And it's not as, maybe not as significant for us in a highly transient culture, but back then you were born, grew up, and died in the same hometown pretty much your entire life. And you just kind of worked in your hometown and that was it. But what the disciples did is they left their hometown, left their jobs, left everything to follow Jesus, this man, and now he's dead, right? They probably sensed a, a sense of emptiness that they had never imagined, right? And, and let's be honest, we often know that death just itself is kind of empty feeling because of the finality of it. And if you've experienced it, friends and family, I know most of us have, uh, death often does not come when you're 95 years old and have your friends and family around you. Oftentimes, death is harsh, it's unexpected, and it's unfair. And this is what the disciples were experiencing, a sense of emptiness that they probably had never felt before. And again, if you've lost someone close to you, you know this to be the case. If you know my story, when I was 19 years old, I lost my dad to a suicide, right? And there's a, a finality of it, of a, a grief, a depression, of a sadness of like, oh my gosh, what is actually happening? And if you put yourself in that place of the disciples, this is how they felt. They felt empty. They felt like our life is over, everything we've given our life for, this man who we loved and respected and we thought was going to do incredible things is dead. And the question is, now what? The question is, now what do we do? And so we'll pick up the story in John chapter 20. If you have a Bible uh, or a phone, if you don't have a Bible, there's a black one somewhere around you you're welcome to take out. And if you don't own a Bible, we'd love for you to take one of those black ones home. It'll also be on the screen. So we'll pick up the story on Easter morning, on Sunday morning, just like a day like today, about what's going to happen next. And here's what it says, John chapter 20, verse 1, it says this. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene was one of the followers of Jesus, came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. So Simon Peter, most likely John here, so two of the disciples, she goes, uh, they, they go and tell him. She goes and tell him, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out, heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then fo following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying there with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, then also went in, saw, and believed, for they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. So you got to imagine here, Peter and John, you're feeling incredibly empty. You're realizing the tomb is now empty. And so you're probably not feeling as empty as you felt before. You're probably like, oh my goodness, he actually rose from the dead. The question is now what it, it kind of reminds me. I don't know if you've seen the uh, movie Sixth Sense. If you haven't seen it, I'm about to give it away, but it's like 20 years old, so you had your chance. Um, but the movie, is, what, what, what makes it so incredible, right? At the end of the movie, the main character you find out has been dead the whole time. And once you find that out, everything else makes sense. And I imagine that's probably what it was like for the disciples a little bit. Like everything Jesus has been saying, they're kind of confused. They don't get it. And in that moment, they start to realize and think back to everything Jesus said. And they're like, oh my gosh, he actually did this thing. And so the question for us is now, what do we do about it? And then we continue, verse 11, it says this, But Mary, Mary Magdalene, who we read about in the first verse, stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus. 
Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she saw him. She said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, but since I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them what he had said to her. So then you have Mary again following Jesus, had had him into, his, into her home multiple times probably, and she sees Jesus is now dead, realizes that uh, he's not in the tomb, and so she goes from feeling very empty to realizing the tomb is not empty, and the question for her again is, now what do we do about this, right? Probably this shock and this awe, like, oh my gosh, what does this mean for me? And then verse 19, the story continues. When it was evening of that first day, so it would have been Sunday night later that day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. So the Jewish leaders killed Jesus, and so they probably feared we're next or thought they're next, so they're hiding away, locked and scared. Then it says this, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So then you have a bunch of Jesus' 12 disciples in this room, right? Imagine what they're thinking. They're, hot, they're scared. They're probably really sad about Jesus. So now they're literally scared for their life, feeling desperately empty. They realize the tomb is now empty because Jesus has, sh- has shown up to them. They're probably really excited, nervous excitement, wondering what's going to happen next. And that's the question. Oh, my gosh, Jesus actually came back from the dead. What do we do now? What happens next? And then finally, verse 24, the story continues. It says this, but Thomas, so Thomas was one of the disciples as well. Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my finger in the mark of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. A week later, his disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And I think here Thomas gets a bad rap. Sometimes he's called Doubting Thomas because what happens? He doesn't believe Jesus is actually risen from the dead. But if you read the story, the reason why the disciples are telling Thomas that he rose from the dead is because the the disciples had actually seen Jesus. And I think if we're honest, we probably all would be like Thomas. Like even though someone said they're going to rise from the dead, you really don't think that's actually going to happen. And so Thomas doesn't believe either until he actually sees Jesus. And then he's like, oh, my goodness, the tomb is empty. Uh, my emptiness feeling, it's kind of going away because I can't believe this is happening. So the question for me is now, what do I do? What do I, what do, I do about it now? What? And what we do find is that the disciples then give their lives quite literally, are beaten, uh, starved, and even killed, telling people that Jesus actually rose from the dead, actually seeing the tomb was empty, radically changed their life. And the reality is everything hinges on whether or not Jesus actually rose from the dead. Like this, this isn't a feel-good story. This isn't like, I hope God is great and I hope Jesus is awesome. Like this, it all hinges on whether or not Jesus actually did what he said he was going to do. And so the question for us this morning is, is that true? Like, did Jesus actually rise from the dead? Because if he did, that has profound implications in our lives. And if he didn't, then what does it really matter? So here's what I want to do is I, I want to give us uh, three, kind of the three main theories of what happened to Jesus what happened to Jesus' body, and then at the end, I just want to propose us to submit to you, if Jesus actually rose from the dead, what implications does it have in our life? Should we respond like the disciples did with wonder and amazement, or should we say, you know, this didn't actually happen, so it doesn't really matter at all? And so here are the main three theories that people kind of present as to what happened to Jesus, what happened to his body, and here's the first one, that someone stole the body. The first theory a lot of people talk about is somebody stole Jesus' body. Now, for someone to steal Jesus' body, they actually would have had to have both the means and the motive to do it. And I think it's really fascinating. We read John chapter 20 here. And what does Mary do? Mary, in this story, says, thinks that someone has stole the body. So it's really fascinating. The disciples knew this was kind of like the leading theory in the first century, and yet they still included that in this gospel. My, my guess is probably because they were just sh- explaining what actually happened. So it's fascinating knowing that this is one of the leading theories to discredit what 
what happened to Jesus, they still include it into the story. Um, and so let's look at this for a second. Who would have had both the means and the motives to steal the body? Uh, the first people we can look at is the Romans. Uh, the Romans obviously can do whatever they want. They're in charge. They're the ones that killed Jesus. Uh, but the problem here is that Pilate ordered a garrison of soldiers to guard the tomb because they had heard whispers that this guy might come back from the grave. And so they wanted to guard the tomb to make sure this wouldn't happen. And so a garrison of soldiers would have been a unit of 16 soldiers. Four would have been a guard at one time, and then there would have been like 12 in a semicircle just kind of sitting around, and they would rotate. Uh, and so uh, we, the problem with the Romans stealing the body is that if someone s- broke the seal of this tomb, uh, Pilate ordered for them to have been killed. And so it wouldn't have been like a joke. Like what if the r- soldiers stole them as a joke? Well, they would be joking with their own lives, so that's probably unlikely to happen. And so the next question is, well, maybe they were bribed. Maybe someone bribed them to steal the body. Uh, and so here we have to look at uh, who would have stole the body, who would might have bribed them. Uh, the first place we can look is the Jewish leaders who actually had Jesus killed. Why would they want to steal the body? Well, they probably would want to steal the body so that the, these Christians, these people that are following Jesus, could go say, hey, look, the body's missing. He actually rose from the dead. Then the religious leaders could say, actually, he's not. The body's right here. And it would have kind of quashed anything that was happening if they actually present the body. And what we know historically, taking away the God and the Bible and all these sort of things, what we know historically is no one knows what happened to Jesus' body. Right? No one knows what happens with Jesus' body. And we do know the religious leaders never stole the body because they never presented the body to kind of stop this movement. And so we know the religious leaders didn't steal the body. Uh, The next suspect we can look at is maybe the disciples. Maybe the disciples wanted to steal the body uh, so that they could say, look, the tomb is empty, and now Jesus actually rose from the dead. This is true. Uh, and so here's the problem with that, though. If they, if they would have stole the body, of course, you have the problem of sneaking past the guards that they wouldn't have seen. And then you have this really fascinating detail that we read in chapter 20 here that says that the wrapping that was around Jesus' head was folded up and put, it, put like on the, where Jesus was lying. And I don't know about you, but when you rob something, typically you don't leave it nice and neat. Like, I don't know the last time you robbed a bank, but kind of like you're in and out as fast as you can. <laughs> and so it's really interesting that not only did they would have had to have stole the body, but they would have to stop. Somehow none of the guards know what's going on. They would have unwrapped his face, and they would have folded it nice and neat and left it in the tomb. So it's a very significant detail. Uh, the other question we can look at is, that in the history of the world, there have been a lot of religious hoaxes. There have been a lot of cults and all that sort of thing. Um, but what's fascinating is those who uh, typically lead these hoaxes or lead these cults, have a lot to gain from it. No, most likely, uh, most often, they either gain money, power, or sex, or a combination of the three. And so let's look at what happened to the disciples and their testimony when j- claiming that Jesus rose from the dead. We know that their testimony gave them no power because their entire lives they were beaten, jailed, and chased from place to place. So they had no power at all in society. Uh, if, if we look at uh, when it comes to money, here's what we know about the disciples. They were notoriously poor, uh, and so they're just, their testimony gave them no power. It gave them no money, and we know we did not gain them any sex because they taught what Jesus taught, that sex was reserved in a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. So they got none of the things that people typically get when they lead religious hoaxes and relig- religious cults, and so the question is why, uh, what would their motive be? What would their motive be? And so we have to ask ourselves, if the disciples lived the rest of their lives in the way in which we know they lived, uh, that they were beaten and, uh, and then literally killed for saying Jesus rose from the dead, would they have done that just for a hoax or just for a joke? Because here's what we know about the disciples. All of them were killed for claiming Jesus rose from the dead, except for John, who was tortured and then sent to an island to be exiled for the rest of his life. And so here's what we find when it comes to someone possibly stealing the body. There is nobody that would have had both the means and the motive to do it. So that is one theory that someone stole the body. Uh, It doesn't seem very likely, but that's one theory. Here's another theory that Jesus never really died. Another theory is that Jesus never really died. Uh, He just fainted. And so let's look at that for a second. Uh, Here's what we know about the Romans. They were experts in killing people, and they were experts in crucifixion. They did it all the time. And in fact, Roman law said if you pulled someone down off a cross before they were killed, then you would be killed in the same manner as them. In other words, you would be crucified if you took someone down before they died, which is why, if you're familiar with the story, we see that the the guards uh, spear Jesus' side before they take him down to see if he's dead. And if you read the accounts of what happens, we see that Jesus, when when they spear Jesus' side, it said blood and water came out, not just blood. And that's a very significant detail to us. It wasn't to them in the first century because they didn't have the medical knowledge that we have today. And here's what we know, that when you die in the area of the body where Jesus was speared, uh, your blood begins to clot and separates from this watery serum. 
So if someone were to actually spear you in that area of your body and you were dead, water, uh, the appearance of water and blood would have come out, which would have signified that you have been dead for at least a couple of hours. Uh, and, and they didn't even know that back then, so it's incredible that that is in there, right? So what it shows is that Jesus was actually dead. Uh, the other problem with Jesus uh, actually uh, being faint, like maybe you're saying, okay, well, Jesus performed a lot of miracles. What, what if he just like faked it and like pretended so they took him off the cross? Uh, here's what we also know. Um, that uh, very, it was very, very rare, rare if it ever happened other than Jesus to be severely beaten and crucified. Typically, you were done, one or the other was done to you, not both. And what we know is that even if Jesus was not crucified, he would have died within 24 hours uh, because of his wounds and because there was no hospital treating him. Right? He would have died regardless, and so then you crucify him on the cross. Uh, that's why he died so quickly, so he would have died anyway. Uh, but if anyone were to survive a crucifixion, let's say he does that, uh, and he and puts himself maybe into this coma, and he's going to wake up when he's in the tomb. Uh, you then have the problem of how Jesus snuck past the guards, uh, pushed this uh, really heavy uh, to, uh, rock away, and then convinces the, his disciples that he's the king of the world. And the reason why that would be hard to do, I don't know if anyone's seen Walking Dead. Has anyone seen Walking Dead? We're in church. You can raise your hand. It's okay. I've seen it. Um, or any zombie movie. But in The Walking Dead, you have walkers. And those people look weak, pathetic, and frail because they're like dead things walking around, their faces hanging off. Like, this is what Jesus would have looked like. So can you imagine with me that some zombie comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to bring the kingdom of earth, follow me, and we're going to change the world. Like, I don't think, uh, maybe you would, but I don't think you would follow someone like that. And so the question is, what Jesus never really died. That is one of the theories that is submitted. But when we know, when we actually look at what happened, that is very unlikely to have happened. And so here is the third theory uh, that's often talked about, and it's obviously what we're celebrating this morning, that Jesus really did die and rise from the dead. Here's a third theory that Jesus really did die and rise from the dead. This is by far the simplest explanation for what happened if you actually looked at what happened. And so the question is, if this is by far the most simplest explanation for what happened, why is it not universally accepted? Um, I love what this German philosopher by the name of Wolfhart Pannenberg says. He says this, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so strong that nobody would question it except for two things. First, it is a very unusual event. And second, if you believed it happened, you would have to change the way you live, right? So first, it's very, I mean, it's pretty unbelievable in and of itself. But the second issue in my experience is by far the number one issue that keeps people away from God. It's not intellectual. I mean, we all have doubts, we all have questions, but it's not, in my experience, the vast, vast majority of people that I have spoken to, their problem is God, with God is not an intellectual problem, but it's a, if this is true, how does it impact and change my life? In other words, we have a problem maybe submitting to God and have him being Lord of our lives instead of ourselves. And I've shared this story before, but I think it illustrates this really well. Uh, when I was in college, in my undergrad, I, I was a religion major. One of my professors that I had, I took multiple times, and I really liked him, and he was a pretty hardcore atheist. I asked him one time, I said, is it not true that if you were to believe in Jesus and become a Christian and all that, like, it's not just an intellectual thing. Like, it would actually change your life. And he's like, no, that's not true. And I was like, but it is. Like, let's say, you know, I believe two plus two is five. And you believe two plus two is four. Like one of us is right, and one of us is wrong. And let's say one day I change my mind and I, instead of believing two plus two is five, I now believe two plus two is four. Like I can change what I think about that and it doesn't change my life. Like I can still live and do whatever I want. But if you were to actually believe that Jesus is who he says he was, that would actually have major implications for your life and how you live. And he's like, no, that's not true. But the reality is it is true. Like if Jesus is God, if he is king, what he says goes. If, it, if we really should submit our lives and trust in him, it has powerful implications for our life. And in my experience, that is the biggest hindrance for people wanting to follow Jesus. And I would also submit this to you this morning. It's also easier not to think about what happened to Jesus than to confront what happened. Like it's really easy to say, I don't think people can rise from the dead because that's a pretty normal thing to think. I don't think people, normal people could do it either. Um, and so let's just, I, I bet someone stole it or I bet he just fainted or I bet they went to the wrong tomb or I bet he had a twin. Like there's all these theories and it's easy just to kind of throw it off and say that must be the case. Until you actually look at it, then you have a problem on your hands because it doesn't look like any of those are logically possible at all. And in fact, one of my favorite passages of Scripture is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that will be on the screen. And this is written by the Apostle Paul uh, in the early 50s A.D. In other words, this was written within 20 years of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And here's what he says. He says this, For I pass on to you as a, the most, as a most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. 
that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, who we talked about, and then to the 12, that's the 12 disciples. And then he says this, this is what I find fascinating. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the, uh, the apostles. And so here's what he's saying. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe what we're talking about is true, why don't you go ask the hundreds and hundreds of people who are still alive and, and could tell you and verify that it happened. And I don't know about you, but that, what, did you, what would you do? You would go ask the hundreds and hundreds of people that are still alive who can verify it can happen. And here's what we also find really interesting about Christianity. It was persecuted. People were beaten, jailed, starved, and even killed for their faith. And yet in spite of all of that, it explodes even in the midst of a Roman empire that was extremely hostile to it. And so the only question is, or the only explanation for that is that actually this actually happened. Otherwise, you have a really hard time sp- saying how hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands of people given their, are giving their lives in the midst of heavy persecution unless this actually happened, right? And so he's saying, if you don't believe this, go and ask for yourself, and then Christianity explodes. The most likely explanation is that Jesus actually did what he said he was going to do, which leads us to this question, if the tomb is empty, now what? But if the tomb is empty, the same questions that the disciples had to face, we now have to face. What does that mean for us? And what I would submit to you this morning, that instead of saying if, because it seems highly unlikely that if is the case, but I would say because. And here's the practical implication that this has for us this morning, and that's this, that because the tomb is empty, our lives don't have to be. What this means for us is because the tomb is empty, our lives don't have to be. And let me just say this, today is April 1st, and so it's also April Fool's Day. And so you've probably already seen on Facebook, maybe you've made this joke, or maybe you'll see it later today. A lot of people, you know, you see the meme of like Jesus coming out of the grave and being like, April Fool's, right? And it's funny, and we laugh, and here's what I just want to say to you this morning. Like, if this has actually happened, this is absolutely incredible. Like, this isn't some feel-good story. This isn't some, oh, ha-ha, like, he came back to life. Isn't that funny? Like, this is incredible. If Jesus did what he said he was going to do, if he made it possible for us to have a relationship with the God of the universe so that we could one day be into, enter into his kingdom and experience grace and forgiveness and hope that you cannot find anywhere else, like, this is not just a joke. This is incredible, right? And I'm not, I'm not knocking that joke. I'm not saying you can't say that joke. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But here's what I am saying, that this should blow our minds, That God himself actually died, said he was going to do it, and then did it, and then comes back to life to give all of us hope and meaning and purpose. And so this is why the gospel is good news. Again, why is the gospel good news? Because there is bad news. Otherwise, the gospel would just be news. And here is the bad news, that God is perfect, loving, and holy, and just. We are not perfect. And so we've all fallen short of his standard. We've all disobeyed God. We've all shamed God. And here's what's interesting. Regardless about what you think about God, all of us have our own standard of morality. And all of us would say we've even fallen short of our own standard, right? And so if God exists and he's perfect, we've definitely fallen short of his. And so the bad news is that God has to do something with our sin. Otherwise, he would not be perfect and just. He has to do something with our sin. And the good news is that he loved you and I so much that he knew this was going to happen, that he sent Jesus to live the perfect life that we not, could not live, to die the death that we deserve, and to come back to life and to conquer, to conquer death so that anyone who would put their faith and trust in Jesus can experience hope and grace and one day enter into God's kingdom where there are no, are no more tears and death and lying, and deceit, we will be able to live and work and play in perfect harmony that we are designed to in this earth that it's not happening because of sin and death. This is absolutely incredible. This is the good news of Jesus. And, and one of my favorite ways I've heard the gospel explained, and so I say it often around here, that because of Jesus, here's the good news, the good news is that in Jesus, you have nothing to prove and no one to impress. Because of Jesus, you have nothing to prove and no one to impress, and here's why. Because God looks at you if you submit your life and trust in Jesus the same way he looks at Jesus, which is perfect, righteous, and holy. Jesus has proved it all, so you have nothing to prove to anyone. And even when it comes to impressing other people, like would you rather impress people that are going to be around for 60, 70, 80 years or the God of the universe where it actually matters? And if God is saying, I am impressed and I accept and I love you because of Jesus, that's incredible. You have nothing, you have no one to impress, and you also have nothing to prove because it has all been proven in Jesus. You have nothing to prove because Jesus did it all by coming and living the life that we deserved. And so the reality is because of Jesus in the midst of our doubts and questions and sins, we don't have to have everything figured out. That is why he came. And it reminds me of one of my favorite passages in scripture. 
uh, one of my other favorite passages in Scripture. And this is in 1 John chapter 2, and I'm just going to read two verses. Uh, in 1 John chapter 1, this is written by John, one of Jesus' closest disciples. Uh, and he's talking about this idea that everyone sins, like we all fall short. This is why Jesus came. And the goal is, as we follow Jesus, that we submit to him and we trust in him. And out of thankfulness, we live, a, we live our lives in, in honor and respect of him. But even in the midst of that, we're, all, we're still human, so we're still going to fall short. And here's what he says. He says this, my little children... I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So that's the goal, not to sin. But here's the reality. In this life, we all still fall short. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not, not, not only for ours, but also for the whole world. Here's why I find this so fascinating, that what's happening as we stumble, as we fall, as we blow it, as we make mistakes, Jesus is at the right hand of God saying, that is my son, that is my daughter, I am fighting actively on their behalf, that is why I came. So in the midst of our doubts, in the midst of our questions, in the midst of not knowing and having all the answers, we can still come to Jesus because that is why he came. And so the question that we all have to confront this morning is the the death and resurrection of Jesus, if that is true, what is your response? Either Jesus is who he says he is to you or he is not, and to not respond is a response that is a rejection of Jesus, right? We can say, yes, he is Lord. We could say, no, he's not. Or we could say, yeah, I'm not sure. And here's the reality. Here's what's so great about Jesus. Even if you're not sure, even if you have questions, even if you've blown it, even if you're not perfect, that is why Jesus came. That in the midst of your questions and doubts, you can still be accepted and loved by the Father. By simply, saying, being, by simply being honest, by saying, look, I'm not perfect, I need help, and that is why Jesus came. Again, because the tomb is empty, our lives don't have to be. And so if you're in the midst of a difficult season, if you're struggling, if you're suffering, what that means is you still have purpose and hope because you know this is not the end. As we saw Mark's story, he, knew, he knows that this is not the end, that God can redeem any story, any brokenness, and he is that big. He is big enough to do anything because he is God, and he decided to come so that all of us, no matter where we are, he took the first step towards us. He didn't wait to say, okay, once you got this figured out, once you try really hard, then you can come to me. No, he said, it, it, before, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's what the scriptures say, and this is why we celebrate this morning that Jesus conquered death so that your life would matter and so that your life would count, not just in this life, but in the life to come. And the good news this morning while we celebrate is that the tomb is empty, and because it's empty, we have hope, we have grace, we have forgiveness right where we are. We can celebrate Easter this today, not because it's a feel-good story, like, yay, God, not because it's a really cool thing, because it's true. And because it's true, it has practical, uh, great, and loving implications in our lives, that all of us, no matter who we are, No matter what we've done, no matter where we've been or where we're going, can find grace and hope in Jesus. In the midst of our doubts, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our hurts, that is why Jesus came, and that is why he suffered, and that is why Easter is good news for all of us. Because we all need Jesus, and that is why he came. Let's pray.